right? Wargaming enthusiasts. Fritz here, taking a look at chain of command support choices. So many toys, not enough points to get them all on the table for my game tomorrow on Sunday. And I thought, hey, since we're taking a look at chain of command, let's do, let's push this up to the YouTube archives. Let's do a rules tutorial. Let's do a flow, a narrative of the game to, to highlight not only how this game plays, but how it's very unique compared to other wargaming systems. And for those of you who have been following my channel or following my blog, uh, the link to my blog is underneath this video. You know, I love Warhammer 40,000. I love sci-fi. I love Star Trek Attack Wing, Judge Dread Miniatures, Battletech, d and I'm a sci-fi guy. Okay, I dabbled in DBA Romans a, a little bit a while ago. But I never had any intention to play historicals. And then about two years ago, my excellent wargaming friend Dave introduced me to Chain of Command. And uh, the rule set was solid. It played extremely well. There were massive tactical choices to make. And we're going to explore some of those options in this uh, tutorial on here. And the suspense of playing the game, it, it was very, very interesting. So... Next thing you know, I'm playing uh, late war Germans, and I've got like 15 tanks and lots of infantry and lots of support choices, and uh, we're deep into World War II. Very, very interesting in this. So Chain of Command, what's unique about it is the fact that it's a rule set, a solid rule set. You can use any type of miniatures that you want. And this, these are Plastic Soldier Company. You can build an army, uh, whether it's uh, British, Germans, Americans, Russians, for with everything you need for about $100, $150. I mean, that's insane. Games Workshop, what does that buy you? Like uh, one HQ and maybe like five Marines or something like that. So from that perspective on the hobby budget, and again, because it's not uh, tied to any specific scale, you could do uh, the medium scale, you could do the heroic scale, you can, use, uh, you can use your bolt action figures for it also and enjoy both systems for the price of admission to one. So from that perspective, I found it to be very, very unique. So the first place to start, before we even get into the mission, of course, is, is to pick your army. I'm playing the Germans. And you start off with kind of a basic detachment of, of infantry and choices on here. So the first would be um, two of these units here, which are led by a junior officer, a rifle team, and two machine gun teams. I would have two of these. I only put out one for this tutorial. And then you would have um, a Panzerfaust team with one and one. That kind of represents the start of your forces. From there, based on the mission, now you have a number of support points. Uh, three points, six points, eight points, 12 points, depending if you're attacker or defender, depending if it's a recon mission, a breakthrough mission. And uh, like other wargaming systems, you can pick the mission you want to play ahead of time. Or you can decide to kind of roll randomly. So you figure out the mission. Now you have a number of support points that you can spend to add, well, more toys to the list. So a, a Panzer II or a Panzer III, depending on the variants. And, and they have all the variants going from early war, mid-war to late war. A lot of interesting tanks and machines. This could be three support points, five support points, and some of the more powerful tanks um, up to eight or 11 support points. Earthquake in the forest here. It's actually like a hidden tank rumbling through there. You also have um, a machine gun team here, three points. You can buy a Panzer Faust team. You can buy a senior leader to issue more commands. So you go through and you have the start of your list, but then you can add more toys with how you want to play. I have my list. My opponent has their list. We don't show each other the lists. Even if you know the basic units that you're going to incorporate, they don't know any of your support choices. So the game then begins with the patrol phase. And this is what's really interesting. You have a number of markers. And based on the rules, you will deploy out these markers and move them around on the table. Now, I have a condensed kind of table here. Um, it's more dynamic, certainly on a full wargaming table, and you can play on any size table that you want. The bigger the table, the better, because range is very, very unique in Chain of Command, and we're going to keep that in mind and, and look at that. But essentially in this patrol phase, you'll place your markers down on the table, table edge, and your opponent will place their markers on their table edge, and then you will move them out 12 inches. 
and they have to remain within 12 inches of each other. So I can start to hop like this and then move one here and you'll kind of spread out the markers. These represent your potential deployment points or they're gonna show your deployment points. When they come into contact with an opposing marker within 12 inches, they're locked down. So if my opponent moved a marker within 12, this is locked, can't move. Once they are all locked down, then you begin to draw lines to determine where you're gonna put your jump off points and they have to be behind terrain. So let's put a jump off point here and let's put a jump off point there back in the forest. What this represents, this was kind of the first unique thing about chain of command in that um, other wargaming systems like Warhammer 40,000, yes, you have reserves, you can have some miniatures off the gaming table, but you know where they are once they're on the table. As soon as you deploy them, you know where they are. So if I put my entire army over on this left flank, my left flank, you know it's gonna have to traverse over to the right. In chain of command, these represent contact points. There could be units hidden here. There could be units hidden over here. If I have a third jump off point um, back far on the table, there could be units hidden down there. You don't know where my units are until you approach these points or I deploy off units from there. And as a commander, I can decide where I wanna go. This opens up um, a really interesting thing because you have all these units but you don't know where they are on the table from the perspective of an opponent. So I know the Americans are out there, right? I might have reports where they're like, look, we've seen some Americans in that forest. Uh, we've seen some Americans in the building in the back and, and the forest to the right. But until we make contact, until uh, we come into range, until they reveal themselves, we don't know where they are. So you have a lot of tactical options right there. It's, it's this interesting tension because you know they're out there but you don't quite know where. So do you want to recon? Um, what do you want to do? So we have our jump off points. The game then starts with command dice and either the attacker or the defender will go first depending on, depending on the scenario. These represent your ability to command units. Now at this point, I'm not gonna move them, but these guys would be off the table, ready to go. You start a turn by rolling the command dice and as you uh, take damage and lose units, these dice become less and less. So in theory right now, I have the potential to activate five units on there. As I lose units and morale breaks, I'll lose dice, I'll activate less and less and less. So you don't always get to activate what you want and you have to kind of be very mindful. It represents literally the chain of command. It represents your senior officer on the table, your headquarters, your HQ, dispatches, whatever, trying to manage the chaos of this battle. So my first roll, um, the variables on the dice represent different options that you can, can use and you can choose. Um, two sixes are really interesting. This is a double run. This means that I get to go again. After I activate my units, I get to roll the dice and go again. Chain of Command is a modified you-go, I-go system in that I roll my dice out, and let's say I roll this instead. I don't have a double run, two sixes, so now I activate my units, I move, and then you go. But since I have this, the two sixes, I'm going to get to go again on there. If you roll a five, so let's, let's actually switch it to a five. Let's get a good um, distribution of stuff out here. So we'll get a five and we'll get a one on there. One are support choices. Five is a chain of command die. Six is nothing. Three is a section. Four is a senior leader. Those are the options. And of course, in the rules, there's uh, a little kind of cheat sheet that you print out. You get to figure out what you do. When you roll a five, for every five that you roll, you generate a command point. And usually we mark this with a dice, a die. When you get to six, you get to spend it to do a variety of options like interrupts or moving units or ambushes. So it's very, very dynamic. And, and we'll kind of take a look at that also in a second. So I've rolled out. Now, right now, nothing's on the table to activate. So I have to figure what I want to deploy. All right, let's deploy the tank with a one because that's a support choice. And I find it useful to put the dice on there. Let's bring out well, see, this is where you have to decide. Do you want to bring out units? Do you want to wait? Do you want to figure out what's going on? Um, I'm going to bring out the junior leader here. That's going to bring on the section. And these are nothing. The four, the senior leader, I'm going to hold off. I would normally hold off because I want my, my senior leader 
uh, in the action once we really need to figure out what's going on. So those are my choices to deploy out. So let's kind of move everything else aside. Now when something comes out, it has to be within six inches of a jump off point. And uh, naturally terrain is very, very important in this game, not only for concealment and cover, but also for line of sight, because what's unique about chain of command, at least from my perspective, is the fact that these units have unlimited range. You know, you're, you're playing Warhammer 40,000 and, and Space Marines with their bolters can shoot 24 inches max. So if you're 25 inches, you're just kind of dancing out there and, and you can't get hit. Chain of command, if you can be seen, you can be hit. That makes elevated positions, you know, a farmhouse with a machine gun team on top of command of the battlefield is insanely deadly. Um, a tank on a ridge with, with the turret on there is, is crazy because there are no ranges. There's a short range, an effective range that'll give you a bonus. But beyond that, it's the entire table. That, that took a lot to get used to. Um, in terms of cover, there's light cover, hard cover. There's wood density where if you're more than three or four inches in, depending on the woods, you can't be seen. So if I deployed these units here, you would not be able to shoot through them. You know they're in the woods, you can physically see them, but you're not able to effectively shoot through. I'd have to move forward. So there's a lot of little interesting um, rule type modifiers on there. So let's deploy out. We'll put these guys out here. Within six inches. So this would be an area type terrain, maybe um, woods or, or hills. You know, you would kind of go over that ahead of time with your opponent. It's a little weird doing this one-handed. There is a unit coherency. They have to stay within the junior leader. You deploy them out. Uh, now, this is actually a really awful deployment because everything is true line of sight. So right now, this rifleman, if he's shooting, he can't shoot through that machine gunner. You need to kind of make sure that when you deploy your line, you have the lanes of fire on there. So they would deploy out. Tanks have to deploy on a road on there. Now, late war, probably being France, repelling uh, the invasion of Fortress Europe, there's gonna be some roads. When this comes on, let's say a road back here, I activate the junior leader, I have a choice. I can move and shoot, or I can move and turn, or move flat out. And on a road, you get a bonus. So we're gonna say we're gonna move and turn. Tanks are also interesting because uh, side armor is huge compared to front armor and compared to rear armor. So I want to make sure, uh, assuming the Americans are coming from this way, of course, that my front armor is facing front. So I'm going to move a D6 and then turn. Turning costs one movement point. It's going to be a plus two bonus on the road, so I move a big three inches. So one, two, three. At that point, I'm not going to turn, so I would reposition my turret that way. So now it would be um, my opponent's turn to go. Now I've left this squad kind of out in the open. I mean, excuse me, not out in the open, but deployed. So if the Americans were deploying somewhere, they could start to shoot on this squad. So you want to choose your jump off points where you can deploy and then start to move and, and kind of uh, fan out from there. Let's look at some options for shooting. Let's kind of fast forward a little bit and look at some options for shooting. So let's say the tank actually made it up here. And I've got my command dice. Let's roll them and see what we get. So I have two support options. Could also be a machine gun team. I've got my senior officer. And I've got uh, sections, not the junior officer in here, the, the section itself for one command. So let's bring in a senior officer so that's going to spend that die. I'm going to attach him to this. Now, the senior officers can issue three orders a turn to this unit or any unit within a command radius. The junior officers can offer, uh, issue two commands a turn. There's a junior officer in the tank on there. We're gonna activate the tank. We're gonna spend the other one to bring in the second machine gun team. I'm gonna deploy that in the forest here. And these don't uh, get spent. The senior officer He's going to issue commands to this squad. Now, the, what's dynamic about the game is the commands that you can issue, I can tell the squad to move and shoot, 
So move a d6 modified by terrain and shock. We'll, we'll take a look at shock in a second. Or I can tell them um, move double or move triple. Move triple, they take some shock. Shock represents uh, disorientation, panic, morale of the unit. It's a very unique feature of this game. I can tell them to stand and shoot. I can tell them to break up into teams and now command individual teams on there. I can use the senior officer or the junior officer to remove shock. I can tell them to go on to Overwatch, where you'll place a, uh, a marker moving this way, and any other enemy unit, even in the enemy's phase, they'll automatically shoot. I love putting a tank on Overwatch, which means anything that comes into the radius of the machine gun or the main gun is just, I'm going to get a free round of shooting. I can tell them suppressive fire. So if there's a bunch of Americans um, over here and we're having a firefight and I want to move this tank up, I can tell this unit to suppress a fire on that American unit, it reduces the dice flow of the American dice. So a lot of options, a lot of commands that you can issue. Uh, let's say we issue the order to shoot. Actually, let's reverse it. Let's say the Americans, well, no, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I'm, getting, I'm seeing so many possibilities just right here. Let's look at um, shooting at these guys into an imaginary American unit, and then we'll look at the imaginary American unit shooting into them. So a rifleman does um, one die. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Two, four, five, six, seven. The junior officer has a machine pistol or a submachine gun. It doesn't have an effective range outside of um, six, eight, 12 inches, so it's not gonna be in range. Even though I just said there's unlimited range. Uh, pistols and things like that are more of close combat. Uh, the machine guns, are deadly. Two, four, five, six, seven, eight. You get eight dice for every machine gun. So right away you can see why I love playing the Germans on here. Two, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this pool represents the rifleman. This represents the first machine gun. This represents the second machine gun. Uh, there are no ammo rules in the game, which is fine by me because it kind of keeps things... Um, flowing on there and it's not like Battletech I got to track every single missile that I fire I'm going to need fours to hit so you roll that out we'll pull off our misses um, you know if I get good rolls right now that means I'm spending all my rolls in, in this demo game rather than tomorrow so those are the hits and now you roll to see what happens one and two are nothing Four or five are shock, six is a kill. If you're in hardcover, five is a shock, six is a kill. Six is always um, a kill. If you're caught out in the open, it could be three, four is shock, five, six, kill. Let's say the Americans, obviously they're in cover, they're hiding behind some wall, hardcover. So it's gonna be five shock, six kill. So we have two kills. Two shock, and the rest miss. Now what's interesting is you're shooting into um, a squad. In other wargaming systems, uh, the leader's kind of immune to the end, or uh, special weapons are immune to the end. You don't know where those hits go. So it's you get to pick the models you want, but you also have to see if your junior leader or leader in the unit is hit. So in this case, the Americans would have a sergeant, a junior leader. You roll a 1d6, and on a 6 that junior leader is hit, so he's not hit. If he's hit, he's gonna get wounded or maybe killed. It's gonna reduce the ability to issue orders to that unit. So the American player would remove two models, or the kills, and then they would place a shock token or a marker or maybe mark it down on paper, either in the rifle unit or the machine gun units, depending on what they have, shock and shock. When you get shock, now that means this unit, that unit firing uses less dice. If you get a certain number of shock tokens, they become pinned. If you get even more, they break and they're gonna run. If you try to move for every shock token, it's minus one inch. So it represents you trying to command um, what's going on and, and how things work. Let's take a look at some Americans uh, firing back at our unit here and we'll kind of assign things out and, and see how things work. So an American unit has, they're gonna have two, four, five, six, seven, 
eight, nine, ten. And let's say they have um, a machine gun choice on there. The American units, late war, are big. So they're going to need um, fours or higher to hit. So we're going to pull off those misses. Still using up all my good rolls because I am rolling those dice. And I'm in hardcover. So again, five, that would be kind of um, light or medium cover, but we're going to say that's hardcover because it represents the hills and the mountains. So we're going to need fives for shock, six for kills. That's, that's not bad. So I'm going to lose one model, and I get to select what that's going to be. And I get to deliver one shock. But we have to roll and see. This is interesting because I have a senior leader in there too. So I have to roll for both of them because that incoming fire could be hitting into here. So uh, on a six, it's my junior leader. He's fine. On a six, it's my senior leader. So he's fine. So that means it gets distributed to one. And we place a shock token on there. So let's talk about uh, interrupts and generating these, these command dice on here. So as you roll two, four, five. So as you roll the dice to see what units you activate and what goes on, as you roll fives, you save those and you generate command dice. When I get to six, I have a command point, chain of command point. I can spend that at any time. I can spend that um, during my phase. I can spend it during my opponent's phase. There's a list of different things you can do. This is where the game gets really, really dynamic. So let's say this is an American tank uh, making its way up, right? I can, it's the Americans' turn. At any point, wherever they get, I can decide to spend a command point and ambush with one of my special weapon teams, in this case, the um, Panzerfaust on here, if they're moving past my jump point. So I could declare an interrupt, spend my command die, it's gone, I have to generate it, and there's no limit to how many you can generate. I mean, you could generate three or four dice and save them. I can deploy out six inches, I could deploy out here, six inches, get that rear armor. You can also interrupt and interrupt. So let's say I have this tank moving forward and my opponent plays an interrupt. So they've got a bazooka team, they ambush. I can now say, okay, I'm gonna spend a command die if I have that interrupt and I'm gonna fire on you with my machine gun. You know, maybe that represents my tank moving through and kind of aware that there could be uh, American ambush teams on there. So we have interrupts back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I can have my tank on the ready. And if a unit moves by, I can spend a die to interrupt and shoot. I can spend a die to issue a command. So I could be moving forward in this example. My opponent spends a chain of command die to interrupt and deploy to ambush, I can spend a chain of command die. You know what? I'm going to move on that road 3d6. Well, that's not the best roll. Let's say it was something like that. Well, still not a great roll, but four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can move 10 inches away. So I'm out of the effective range. I'm out of the arc. A lot of tactical options with developing those command dice. So now the game gets kind of interesting. You start taking some losses and as you take losses, one, two, three, four, five, let's say my tank gets blown up. As soon as you lose a unit, you have to roll on a morale chart to see what happens. And depending on the unit, it'll start uh, taking away command dice. So when a support choice gets blown up, I need a smoke marker out there, you roll a D6. Well, six is actually the worst. So I would lose um, one or two command points. As this goes down, your army becomes less and less effective. Uh, one is the best I could do. It would be nothing. So from that roll here, on my five dice to start, because that uh, Panzer II got blown up, I would lose one of these dice. Now every turn, the best I can activate is potentially four units. Uh, six is nothing for a double run. Five would generate a chain of command die. I can activate my junior officer in here. I can activate my senior officer on there. So what we would do here, let's see. So remember we had one shock from before. So senior officer is going to activate. He has three commands. He's going to remove a shock. He's going to tell this unit 
to possibly move forward 1d6 and fire at half, or maybe I want to pull back, um, move 2d6, or just uh, fire in place. So back and forth with what we want to do and how we want to operate. That's the flow of chain of command, kind of in a, in a nutshell. And this was only going to be like a 15 minute video, but I'm, I'm seeing so many tactical options in there. But the game is really interesting because the flexibility to move back and forth, you having these jump off points where you don't know where things are going to deploy. You don't know what they're going to do. As your units take damage, taking shock, it, it represents this, the fact that these are you know, trained soldiers. These are elite soldiers, but they're still men. And uh, an interesting story was uh, when I first started playing Chain of Command, you know, I'm used to playing Warhammer 40,000 Space Marines. Uh, these are eight foot tall, genetically engineered superhumans dedicated in their faith to the God Emperor of mankind, the immortal God Emperor. So in 40K, you tell, you tell those space marines to take the hill. They're going to take the hill. They're going to run up there. You don't have to make any morale checks. If they lose eight or nine marines, you know, that's fine. It's no big deal. So I'm used to playing war games where if you tell your unit to do something, they'll do it. So I have my Germans, and I tell them, you know, there's this hill. I figure if I can get up to the hill with my two machine gun teams, I will have a great vantage point. There's a British machine gun team potentially in this farmhouse in the back. Uh, there's a jump off point there. My opponent did not deploy the machine gun team yet. So I know it's lurking somewhere. I know it can come out somewhere. So I go, okay, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll run up there and take that hill. So I run up the hill. I get to the top of the hill. Elevation, no cover, nothing. You know, there's like this. There's like one little shrub up on, on the hill there. Um, on the British turn, they deploy out the machine gun team. It's a Bren machine gun. So not a ton of dice, uh, certainly not like the uh, German machine guns, but a decent amount of dice. Plus there's a rifle team in there laying down some fire. I start taking shock, massive amounts of shock. And I only have a junior officer in there. I don't have my senior officer. So I'm suddenly pinned on the hill and this unit is doing nothing. And when it can potentially activate based on my command dice. I'm removing two shock, but I'm taking losses and I'm generating shock more than I can. And these men are wondering who is the idiot that told them to run up the hill uh, with no cover, with no support. I didn't even have another machine gun team say, uh, if I had this heavy machine gun team on the, the tripod, if I deployed them out, put them on overwatch or suppressive fire into that building in the back, uh, the Bren machine gun team wouldn't be able to shoot. If I had a tank and rolled the tank up and put the tank on overwatch, so if they show up and deploy, I can hit them with, uh, you have anti-tank and high explosive rounds. I could hit them with high explosive rounds. I mean, lots of tactics. Uh, I just, hey, this is like my second game, right? And I'm used to 40K, not this historical real deal stuff. So just absolute no tactics running up there. My unit's pinned. They're not doing anything. I've got a whole section standing up there. British are pouring uh, out of the walls. They're pouring out of every rat hole and trying to outflank me. It's just just absolutely crazy. I mean, target-rich environment with my tank. I'm, I'm shooting uh, high explosive rounds. It, it was an interesting game. But that's where I learned that chain of command. It's about support units. It's about slowly advancing. It's about realizing that there could be a unit in this forest. It hasn't deployed yet. It may or may not be there. So let's get some cover fire. Let's get some suppressive fire. Let's get generate some chain of command dice. So if they do appear, I can pop a command die and, and do something. So it's very much back and forth. And the other unique part to close certainly you take casualties, but most armies break or retreat way before they get wiped out. Compared to Warhammer 40,000 or Battletech, I'm used to games where we fight to the bitter end, every single last model, unit, stand, element, whatever we're going to call it, lance mate, uh, fights it out. Uh, these guys take some losses, they break. Your tank gets immobilized, the crew bails out. These guys take some losses, they drop and, and run, or they withdraw back and now they're pinned. You lose command dice, you lose command dice, you lose command dice till you're down to one. And now you can't win. When you lose all your command dice, the game ends on there. So certainly check out Chain of Command. I'm going to try to film some segments of the battle tomorrow uh, with these kind of concepts in play, bits and pieces on there to give you an overview and action. And I have to say, out of all the historical games that I have played and enjoyed, 
Uh, this rule set has captured my imagination the most and has captured my enthusiasm the most.